Stephanie Berry began as a features writer at The Republican and Mass Live, but she quickly moved into news reporting. And since then, the bulk of her work has been anything but light. Since 2010, Barry has spent most of her time reporting on white collar and organized crime. Barry joined me in the studio to discuss the latest prosecutions of Springfield-based members of the mob and what it's like covering that beat. I went into journalism wanting to cover features, social issues, you know, curing the world's ills. But I was covering um, a trial in federal court and the beginning of my career it was actually a serial killer trial. And there was an indictment of a large number of organized crime members. And my editor said, hey, since you're in the building, can you just go cover this just case? swing by this other just little case. swing by. And so I did, and um, that's where it started. Here you are. Here I am. And so most recently, there's been a lot of news over the past several weeks looking at five specific defendants who were attached to organized crime here in Springfield. Uh, among them is Ralph Santanello, and he was among those sentenced, and he was you know, connected to a larger crime family based out of New York. What's the reaction been with the wrapping up of these most recent five convictions? Well, the reaction has been, it's, I sort of feel like organized crime in Springfield anyway is cyclical. So I began covering organized crime when Al Bruno was in power. He was murdered. That was a huge deal. Nothing like that had happened in Springfield for decades. Um, and then there's usually kind of a quiet period. And Santanello really stepped up and, and took that role, is that right? Not following Bruno's murder. So following Bruno's murder, one of the men who actually was convicted of his murder, Anthony Arrelata, um, he came into power. He was a younger guy with younger associations. Um, but he was among 10, I want to say, who were prosecuted for that crime, eventually he went to prison and that prosecution basically cleared the streets of all the made guys in Springfield. Um, and so there was a quiet period after that and then Ralph and his co-defendants started moving around. It feels like it never goes away. It feels like it might go away, there's a quiet period, but inevitably another group comes back to kind of just model the same behaviors, do the same schemes. And there were several years, I mean, um, this this conviction took place, or excuse me, this arrest took place in 2016. Correct. So there's been a few years that have gone by. What took so long to sort of get us to this point? It's an interesting question. So um, that might require a little bit of speculation on my behalf, but um, so C.J. Morrell, the towing operator who wore the wire on these guys. And really spoke out against them in court over the, the, the last recent weeks. Yep, he was the star witness at the trial of Valentini. Richard Valentini was the only one to take it to trial. All the other four pled out. Um, but so C.J. Morrell had to take the stand, and he was the government's central witness. Um, so this occurred, they approached him at his land in 2013, they didn't bring the case until 2016. Perhaps they were trying to build up, you know, oftentimes the feds will go after a RICO case, but that requires more than just kind of one act. So maybe they were trying to build a bigger case. I can't really say why it took three years to bring the case. Any sense from prosecutors, you know, um, the the sentence for Ralph Santino was five years, the others it was sort of a varying number of years any sense from prosecutors whether they were satisfied with the number of years that he was sentenced? Well, the prosecutors usually will not weigh in after the fact, but I can tell you they were seeking closer to seven, and his defense lawyer was seeking, I believe, three years. So it landed somewhere in the middle, which is usually how sentencings work. For you, you've covered this for many, many years for Mass Live and the Republican. And I think that the outside world looking at this might say, you're covering a very dangerous territory, very dangerous people. Have you ever felt nervous about covering this beat? I haven't, and I don't know if that makes me naive. I, I don't think that's a word most people would use to describe me. But I haven't, and I think as part of it is, so covering organized crime now is not like in the prohibition era. Um, the media is part of the landscape now. And I think people getting into this business, for lack of a better word, 
they know it's just part of the gig. If they are not looking for media coverage, you know, go become a shoe salesman or a dentist. It's just part of the landscape, and I think everyone accepts that. On the other side of reporting, you've also been looking at a case where the Department of Justice is investigating the narcotics unit uh, of the Springfield Police Department. What's the status of that investigation so far? So the status of that is multi-layered. Currently, there's a federal grand jury going on in Springfield, reportedly focused on the narcotics unit and a specific series of events that unfolded um, in 2016. And at the same time, the Department of Justice is conducting an administrative re review called Pattern and Practice, which kind of looks more at policy. And if something is systematically wrong, what's contributing to that? And then on the state side, there's a separate grand jury ongoing looking at um, a 2000, 2015 fight outside Nathan Bills. Um, allegedly between some off-duty police and some civilians who were injured. And so that's you'll keep following that, I imagine, for Mass Live and the Republican as it unfolds. For you, whether it's looking at white-collar crime, you know, police alleged police corruption, or dealing with coverage of the mob, as you have, people gravitate, I think, to these types of stories. Do you have a sense from having either talked to them or just your own personal experience what it is that attracts people to this type of information? I think it's... Um, <clears throat> to put it kind of simply, I think these are worlds that a lot of people are interested in, but not many people have access to. So many people are interested in police work and, you know, criminal investigations and organized crime. But what, sec you know, what percentage of the population actually has access to take a deeper look into it? So I think that's part of it. It's a little bit foreign, perhaps a little bit ex exotic to people. It's the stuff that sometimes movies and books are made of, but you're covering it in the real world every single day. Right. I really appreciate you coming in to speak with us today. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.